Well, my name is John Burnside, and yes, I'm going to talk to you today about the Turkestan ground jay. That's this great little bird that you can see here. So I work at the University of East Anglia, and I'm primarily a conservation scientist. And I've had the great pleasure for the last nine years or so of working in this place. This is called the Kizilkum Desert. And the Kizilkum Desert, which actually means red sands, um, is found in the middle of Central Asia and it's split between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Um, the Kizilkum Desert's really uh, one of these last remote places in the world, and it's a very fascinating place to be. Um, it's a semi-arid desert, so it's not a true desert, and typically it's also a cold desert. So when the winters, you get very, very cold weather into the minus degrees often, and in the summers, it gets very hot, well into the 40 degrees. Um, most of my time spent there has been studying this bird, as Rob mentioned. This is the Asian Hubara. It's really an iconic desert species, um, a desert specialist really, and it's a migrant uh, breeding in Central Asia and migrating down into southern Iran and Pakistan and historically into the Middle East. Um, but I'm often running around that area and this is a really classic bird you see there. Um, the desert doesn't have a huge number of different species, but overall there's about 200 species of birds uh, with a lot of birds migrating through it. So for example here you can see a steppe eagle sort of on its way through. You also get a lot of birds uh, breeding there, um, desert birds breeding there. I think about 50 species. This is a palace sand grouse. I'm just using excuses to show you nice pictures really. Uh, this is a, an Egyptian night jar that also breeds in the area. But uh, when I'm out studying the Asian Hubara, quite often you will hear a sound before you'll see a bird. And that is this sound, if everyone has their volumes turned up. I hope that you can all hear that. That's the alarm call of this little bird you see in front of you, the, the Turkestan ground jay. It was recently, I think, renamed the Turkestan ground jay, but previously it's been called Pander's ground jay, or also the Saxaul ground jay. Saxaul is actually a type of um, shrub in the desert, which uh, uses a lot. So you might have heard those different names. Well, um, a ground jay is actually a, a type of corvid, and it gets its name ground jay really because it spends a lot of its time running around the ground and that's where you'll see it because it really forages uh, in, the, in the undergrowth and picks through the sand to try and find, to find food. So it, it, yeah, it is a corvid and it actually it's quite unique. It's um, in the genus Podoces where there are actually only four species within this genus and they all occur in Asia. So we have the Iranian ground jay, which obviously occurs around Iran, and then the Turkestan ground jay, which is further north. And then there are these two species also in um, further into Asia, so in China and in Mongolia. So they're all related and they're, they're quite unique, really. Um, about the Turkestan ground jay in particular, I might refer to it as GJ. Sometimes that's what we, we refer to it as quickly, the GJ. Uh, on this map, you can see Central Asia, of course, and this orange blobs, this is the, the um, range of the ground jay. So you can see on the left in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, it sort of has this contiguous population, which goes through potentially the, the southern Kizilkum Desert and then in, into Turkmenistan, this is the Karakum Desert. But you'll notice up in the top right hand corner, there's a tiny a couple of tiny little isolated populations also in Kazakhstan and as far as we know there's no movement between them. So I was really really interested in this bird. We, you have to see it to believe it really. It's quite charismatic and um, it's very interesting to watch and it has lots of personality and I thought you know it's, it's quite an interesting bird and I started looking a bit more in a bit more detail um, into it and I found it with the IUCN rated it as least concern and in Uzbekistan and, and Turkmenistan, it's not listed as threatened either, which is, which is great news, of course. In Kazakhstan, it's in the red data book, probably because it is a very small area of occurrence.
But when I looked in further detail at the reason behind these um, threat and statuses or lack of threat statuses, I find that there's actually been no work done on the Grind J, uh, scientific work at least, since probably the sort of 70s and 80s into the Soviet period. And if you look at the references cited for the, the justification in these um, categorizations, it's all from pre-90s really. So just out of interest, I thought it's, it's such a charismatic bird, it's locally limited to these areas. Um, um, it would be good to update and understand its status a little bit more. So it was with this uh, motivation in mind, uh, I applied here for, with Anna Ten, who you can see uh, it, uh, sort of on the left, um, well, Valia, Valentin Soldatov's on the left and Anna Ten is to the right, and then there's Alex Brighton. I applied with Anna uh, for an Osme grant and we were successful in uh, getting that grant. Um, and so in 2019, we headed out to start to fill in this gap in knowledge on the on the grind J, and we thought we'd start with breeding productivity and i mean this, the reason why we chose this was because first of all i spent a lot of time studying breeding productivity of birds in the desert already so it's something i know a bit about but also of course breeding productivity is a primary and key factor in understanding the conservation or management of any any bird species so yeah, we headed out in uh, 2019. Back to this map again, the black square that you can see on the map, that is where we did the study. That is the Bukhara province of Uzbekistan. And that's where I also study Asian Hubara. So we have a lot of existing information on that area. And to study nesting productivity, you have to find nests. That's your first, uh, your first goal. This picture in front of you, this is actually a Turkestan Grand J nest. Um, very difficult to see, obviously. Um, in this next picture, if you look closely, this is the same bush, and you might happen to see a little black eye right in the center with a glint in it, and maybe a black tail. So you can imagine uh, these, these nests could be quite hard to find, like a, a lot of birds in the desert, their nests can be difficult to find. So when we set out on the field work, we weren't, we'd never really looked for these nests before, so we thought, how are we going to find them? But uh, thankfully, um, thankfully, Grindjay are quite helpful in helping you find their nests because they have this adaptation that when they see a predator and they're nesting in their territory, they will start to call, make this alarm call, and they will attract the attention of the predator and try to draw it away from the nest. And if you're a fox, this might work, but if you're a, a, a clued in human, you realize that there's obviously a nest in the area. So you start to, to look around. So this is one of the methods we find. We'd uh, find birds calling and making alarm calls and we would search for the nests. Or more correctly, Anna and Valia would search for the nests. Um, and you could come across them. Another method was to stand on a hill and observe the area and try to watch the ground jay going back. And that's what you can see here in this picture. This is Valia. He stood in front of a nest. And you might notice that if you have a clear enough picture, that the bush in front of him has a sort of white area with a little hole. If we zoom in closer, this is the nest. And it's, it's actually in a small astragalus, astragalus bush. Um, you can see that they, they pick up these dry twigs and they make a kind of uh, roof over the top of the nest. And they leave a hole in the front and often a hole at the back, which they use to enter and exit from. You might just be able to see some eggs um, in the nest cup just there. So using these methodologies over and over about six weeks, on the map on the left, you can see a picture of the study area, which is in uh, Gasly. Or it's just south of this area called, called Gasly in Bukhara. Um, these squares are quadrants that we searched. Uh, sort of thoroughly over that period of time. And then the points on there, I won't go into it in detail, but the points there are some vegetation sampling points and nests that were monitored and old nests that were found. All in all, the, the team found 178 different nest cups, but most of these were old, so they stay around for a long time. And they found 37 active nests. And so those nests they found, they subsequently monitored and let me see if this video will work. They did this with this with nest cameras. Hope everybody can see this is a, a GJ. I'm not sure if it's a male or a female, but it's returning to the nest cup. Very 
striking little passerine. So back. So to monitor nesting productivity, you need to monitor the various stages and understand each stage. So here you can see uh, a clutch of eggs inside, uh, inside the nest. And it's actually, the nest cup is lined with camel hair, which is quite interesting. So it must be very, very, very cozy. So we, we looked at clutch sizes over these series of nests. Um, it's about 4.8 eggs on average. And these birds incubate these eggs for 18 days. Then after that, they hatch and you see they have these uh, nestlings and they'll incubate these or rather brood them for another 18 days. So the total period of the bird being laid until it, it leaves the nest is about 35, 36 days. So it's a long period of vulnerability for any, any bird to be in a nest. And then once these uh, birds fledge, this is sort of what they look like. This is a juvenile ground jay. It's quite distinct from the adult. You can see it doesn't have the black patch. So I'm going to try and show another video here. Uh, just to mention, these videos are all on YouTube as well. So if you don't get good video quality right now, you, you're welcome to go along afterwards and, and see them in better quality. Um, you don't have to concentrate on the words here too much, but overall, uh, from the nests that we find, uh, about 19% of them successfully produced fledged chicks. So that was about 81% failed. And from those 81%, we found the reason for failure was predation in 88% of that. So predation is really the main cause of failure. Uh, using nest cameras, we were able to establish the identity, identity of various predators. You saw a fox there, first of all, trying to get into a nest. In this image here, it's a little bit hard to see, but on the bottom right hand side, you can see the, the backside of a, a desert monitor lizard. This is a really uh, common nest predator. And you can see the two ground jay parents frantically trying to uh, get this monitor lizard away from the nest rather unsuccessfully. And here uh, is another nest predator. This is a hedgehog. This, this video, this is just a series of images, um, but you might be able to see the little eyes of the hedgehog popping in and out. Uh, yeah, again, another nest predator. This is actually the Asiatic wildcat. Um, it's not particularly common in the area, as I would say, but uh, they are known to predate, predate the odd nest. And finally, here is a, this is a very blurry video, sorry, but there, you might be able to see the little eye shine there. This is a diadem snake climbing into the bush, and this is the same snake coming out of the bush the next morning, um, which uh, has its belly full of what we can presume are quite well-grown grown chicks. And you might also see the parents in the bottom. So from these um, videos of nest predators, we, we see that ground jay are vulnerable to predation in the nest, and they have a wide variety of different nest predators from the desert. And none of these are particularly, I would say, alarming. They were all, they would be all what we'd, we'd expect. But not all nests were unsuccessful, actually. Quite a few were successful in the end too. And in this, uh, what we call sort of David Attenborough-esque um, video, you can see some fledglings about to take their first intrepid leap into the, into the world. And you see the very impatient, uh, starting to push each other out of the nest. So overall, um, the nesting success of ground jays, uh, Turkestan ground jays, is similar to what was found in Iranian ground jays, um, both exposed to a wide variety of predators, and also probably similar to other passerines, although it's hard to make direct comparisons with other passerines. But at the moment, based on my knowledge of the predators in the desert, I wouldn't say that um, nesting success is particularly low for these birds. It's probably what they're uh, adapted to. So one last chick there, ready to go. So I'll go back to stop this video. Going back to the presentation. So here's a very, very boring table, but all it says really is that um, we looked at various stages of the nesting period and we were able to estimate the productivity.
So just secondly, we also looked at the habitat of uh, the Grind J, um, and this is the most important bit really. We were able to use an existing database of uh, vegetation from the entire region that we'd, that we'd gathered on the Asian Hubara project. And we were able to use this also to understand the habitat selection of Grind J. Uh, this image here, this is really typical typically good Grand Jay habitat with lots of structure and different height. Um, this bush you can see in the front is called a saxaul, saxaul bush, and um, it's really preferred by the Grand Jays. This is just a collage. Out of 17 different types of shrubs found in the region, we find that Grand Jays nested in seven of them. And uh, yeah, again, a, another boring table, but the most important thing to draw from it is, is that uh, two species in particular stood out as very important um, for ground jay nesting. Uh, one was the caliginum group and the second was the saxile group or haloxylin species. These were chosen at 42 times the rate that they occur in nature, uh, they occur normally, and five times for the caliginum. So these two plants were selected over and above the rest for nesting. So it's really, really important to protect these. Um, uh, all of our work there really suggests that the ground jay is probably in quite good shape in that area. We also do population surveys every year for this species, um, just off the back of the Hubara work, and overall it seems quite stable. This uh, area of Ghazli, where, where the study was conducted, is probably the best area in Uzbekistan for these birds. And while I don't see any great, um, any great uh, threat to them at the moment, I would say that this it's important to protect this area so that they don't get uh, so that the area is not developed and perhaps causing future decline. Um, the work that we did here which was funded by OSME and UBA, uh, that's the University of East Anglia, uh, was published in the Journal of Ornithology and it's open access and you can read about it there. Uh, Dave Schuyler who's worked with us in the past also wrote a piece on um, the ground jay and its habitat use a few years ago, which is also open access, and that's in Birding Asia. So I would say anybody can uh, read those if they like. Um, and yeah, I would just like to finally, finally acknowledge, acknowledge OSME um, and University of East Anglia, and also the Emirates Bird Breeding Center for Conservation. Um, they're the, the breeding center I work with in Bukhara, and they supported us in this work quite a lot. And, and of course, Anna Ten was part of this project, um, and Valentin Soldatov, who's a really great field driver and field biologist, and also Alex Brighton as well, who helped us do the field work and write up the study. So I might have run a little bit over time there, but I'd like to thank everybody for listening to the talk, and I hope the video has worked. Thank you very much, uh, John. That was fantastic. Um, you haven't run over time at all. That you've got one minute left, um, so we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Um, just a, a comment, really. Uh, I mean, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, thanks very much as well for kind of leading a, um, a, a really fantastic um, project on the um, on the Turkestan ground jay. Uh, that was delighted that Osmi could fund uh, that uh, that work or at least contribute to the funding of that work um, and it really is um, a fantastic um, a fantastic piece of research so um, thanks very much to, to you and your colleagues um, there's a couple of questions I'll, I'll ask one if uh, that's okay um, have you any evidence that the species might be declining um, so is least concern a, um, a an appropriate category for the IUCN red list wow. I don't really, I think they don't really have enough data. That's, the the data is based on um, a citation from Midge et al in 1990, which was based on a reference from somewhere else. If you see what I mean, it's a reference of a reference. So it's not really primary data. Um, I've only been working in the desert for 10 years there. I try I tried to get some comparison of the, the rate of seeing ground jays uh, that we had, and we did an estimate of our rate of seeing the birds, the, 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 the detection rate, but it wasn't really possible to compare it against anything in the past. I, I find a few references from Turkmenistan in the 40s, for example, where they seemed very abundant. So I would say no doubt there's probably fewer than there was 100 years ago, but um, in this recent part of um, in this recent part of history, for the last 10 years we've been surveying Asian Nubara, and every year we've counted Grand Jay. And I've looked at that data, which I hope to write up soon, 
But in our area of study, at least, the population seems to be stable, which is quite good news. But I must say that I would call the bird locally common, but I wouldn't call it abundant. Um, you know, you, you definitely know where to find it and you'd be guaranteed to see it if you went there, but uh, you wouldn't see th sort of thousands of them. And in the areas I've been to in Uzbekistan, this area we worked is really the best area by far. And in other areas, you'd see them at a much, much lower rate. So at the moment, I would say um, that they seem stable in the region. Um, and I would be cautious about saying that they're without threat because that area is full of, full of development um, for mining, power lines, um, growing settlements and agriculture. So, yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks. And a very quick question, uh, if you can answer this one quite, uh, quite quickly. Just um, Yoav Perlman has asked uh, several questions, um, but I'll just pick one if that's okay, Yoav. Uh, one of the questions is, could the isolated Kazakhstan population actually represent a separate species? Have there been any genetic or phylogenetic studies? So if you could answer that one quite quickly, that would be good. As far as I'm aware, no studies whatsoever. Uh, it, it, it might, who knows if it was contiguous in the past, but it's definitely not contiguous anymore. Um, I would like to do a bit of study in the future, maybe tracking some of the individuals, but I can't see how they would really move between those two populations. But uh, it'd be interesting to, to check this out. But at the moment, there's no, no data at all. Okay, well, we look forward to receiving your application for a conservation fund grant right. to do right. that in the future. And um, if you do uh, a write-up of the um, 